Okay, welcome to our Erev Shabbat class. Erev Shabbat and Yom Shemini of Hanukkah, Parashat Mitches. It's all about the presentation. Sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it. And it's not what is said, but who says it as well, in order to be impactful and to influence other people. Today's parasha, of course, is the dramatic scene um, between the uh, brothers who come to Misraim. First of all, of course, Yosef is elevated into the uh, incredible position of Viceroy of Misraim, um, which is a fairy tale story almost in and of itself. And then, of course, there is the reunif reunification, you can say, without them knowing, of the brothers who come to Misraim to be, buy food and save themselves from the famine in Eris Canaan, and Yosef, who estranges himself to them, and they go through this back and forth and this conversation until eventually he manipulates the situation, which, um, sort of speak, forces them back to Eris Israel holding Shimon, uh, coming back with food to Israel, but then having their money returned to them and their, their subsequent fear in seeing that that occurred. And uh, we see that Yaakov Avinu, although he should allow them to go right back and fulfill Yosef or the Viceroy's leader uh, request, rather, which is to bring Binyamin back under that condition. That should be the logical thing to do. And also we're going to have to get more food eventually. But <clears throat> Yaakov, you know, holds out. Despite the fact that the Uben puts up a good, strong argument, despite the fact. And yet we see closely afterwards, soon afterwards, he ends up agreeing to send them back with Binyamin based on a different request. What I like to do is do some compare and contrasting and uh, in ensuing questions. And then, of course, the lessons that resonate from that comparison. So right now, we're in Parashat Mikhez. We're in Perek Membet in Bereshit chapter 42. We're at the end of that Perek in Pasuk Lamed Zayin. This is where they come back and they inform Yaakov, good news and bad news. Good news, we got the food. We have some supply for a while. Bad news, uh-oh, uh, we lost the son on the, in, in the interim. <laughs> Shimon's over there. And they like this leader, for some reason, wants your youngest son back. Um, of course, Yaakov was very disappointed. What'd you do? How'd you get us into trouble? They explained to him the whole story. And uh, he's, uh, he's besides himself. He's irate. What'd you do to me? Shekaltem, Oti Shekaltem. Yosef's not here. Of course, uh, maybe some prophetic hinting going on. And maybe subliminal, has some subliminal uh, understanding that Yosef really was alive. He says, Enenu, put that aside. Shimon is not here either. Benjamin, they'll take. What else do you want from me? No more children? Okay. So this point, Pasuk Lama Zayin, Ruben steps up to the plate. He's the oldest. He is taking the initiative and uh, naturally trying to play the role of leader. He says something that seems a little radical. He says, if I don't bring Binyamin back, in other words, please allow us to return to fulfill the condition to bring your youngest child Binyamin with us. And I guarantee if I don't bring him back, you can, you can kill my two sons. That's how strongly I feel about this. Just put him in my hands. I'll bring him back. Guarantee. Yaakov's reaction? No. I'm not going to send him. Uh, do I have to remind you that his, his only brother from that, uh, the cherished wife of mine, that I already passed away. And this is the last one from that marriage. And uh, what's my life worth afterwards if he doesn't return? No is the answer. All right. The Torah goes on to tell us in the beginning of the next Perek, that there was a real unending and intolerable famine. The, the situation became untenable. They, you know, 
whatever they purchased had already dissipated and disappeared. Now, how much time has passed? Well, we just know from doing the math that this can't be a lot of time that it passed without getting into the details as a matter of weeks or months that passed, maybe a couple of months. And uh, he tells them, go back and get us food. We ran out. We're going to starve. And uh, Yehuda said, lest I remind you what the condition, what the deal was. We can't go back without Binyamin. And uh, again, Israel says, or Yaakov says, why'd you even tell him we had a son? He explains himself. And then Yehuda steps up to the plate. We're in Perek Mem Gima Pasuk Het. Two, a two pasuk presentation of Yehuda. But Yom Yehuda Yisrael Abiv, Shilcha Hanad Iti Vinakuma Vinelecha. Send the young boy with me. We'll go. We'll travel. Vinichyev Lonamut. We'll live. We're not going to die. Gamanachnu, Gamata, Gam Tapenu. We'll live. You'll live. Our children will live. Everything's going to be okay. Alamak. We feel very confident about this. Anuchi Ed Benu. I'm guaranteeing him. He's my security. I'm the security for him, you can say. I'll be, the buck's going to stop here. I'll be the one that takes responsibility and you can, you know, you have recourse. Just go right to me. He's on my hands. He's in my hands. He's on my head. If I don't bring him back and actually present him back before you, that I'm a sinner for the rest of my life. Strong presentation. It wouldn't have had delayed. You could have been back and forth twice already and had that much more food. Of course, they were wealthy, wealthy family. It wasn't a lacking purchase power that they had. And indeed, lo and behold, Pasuk Aleph, Israel, their father said, okay, if that's the case, here's the plan. Bring them some gifts. Uh, prepare, let's pray, and go on your way. In and indeed, he was successful in cajoling his father to bring Benjamin to Mitzrayim. Our question is so obvious. Before we do any comparing, the, the surface level comparison seems to be there. You have the oldest son, you have the fourth oldest son, they both both put up strong argu arguments. They both were very boldly presenting themselves before their father in the strongest terms and convincing him, which seems to be a no-brainer request, because we need to food, we need to get our brother back. And after all, you know, what's the chances he's going to die? However, under no circumstances, did Yaakov heed the call of Reuben? And immediately he responded to Yehuda. And the obvious question is, what is the difference? And so with some comparing and contrasting and using some of the commentators, we can not only resolve that, but really bring ourselves to um, some profound and credibly important life lessons uh, based on what Yehudah did to do, but what Yehuda did to do, and how Yaakov Abinu felt about that. So... You know, we start with just the practical, just the practical. First, you can see that the Uban seemed very impulsive, right? And some something that said something that seems radical. Uh, some say he didn't mean actually kill my children. Maybe he meant take them out of the inheritance. Maybe just punish them. It still felt. When's the last time we saw that? By the way, so then we see that in Parashat Vayera with Lot, telling the crowd in Sidon Vahamora yes, that I have two daughters that have never been with the man. Fadal. Take them, right? Uh, that was rough. And obviously, that was um, not appropriate, we feel, on the behalf, on behalf of Lot. And so last time we saw something like that, so the event seemed to be um, a little inappropriate, uh, impulsive, and um, maybe too much, too much. But in any case, he did have a very strong presentation. So now to IID, send them, I'll take responsibility. So practically speaking, um, this is all uh, obviously as usual, uh, being able to be resolved in the nuances of the text and the Peshat. Mm -hmm. We see the words of Yehuda saying, mm -hmm. what was his argument? It says that I see very simple, play the odds. 
play the odds. If we stay here, including Benjamin, 100% chance of dying. If he goes there, I don't know, what odds are Vegas giving on Benjamin, right? Uh, okay, 30% chance of dying, whatever it is. It's not 100%. So which one are you taking? All right, it's a very practical presentation. Ramban throws us, uh, at us other practical points. One, which is, um, we know that Yehuda has already presented himself as highlighted in last week's Parashah Vayeshev as a blooming leader figure, was a leader elsewhere in another important part of his life, something that we discussed in, in, in classes in past years. Um, so indeed, there was something that he saw in Yehuda that gave him reason to rely more upon him. And on the, you know, conversely speaking, we see that Reuben, going back to Parashat Vayeser with Zilpah, uh, Pilegesh Aviv, we saw, we saw already had some wrongdoing on his record, maybe less reason to trust him, says the Ramban. Also, an incredibly important practical point, and that is, <clears throat> ask ourselves, why didn't Yehuda speak up to begin with? Say something the first time around. If you had such a, a powerful, persuasive argument to offer, you remain silent. Purposely, says the Ramban, because he was waiting to, you know, uh, actually, in a few months from now, uh, be faced with a scene where there was less food or no food. For Yaakov, you know, to actually have to feel and face the music, so to speak, that that impending danger of not having food. This is not just, oh, I can't pay my rent this month. This is, I can't eat tomorrow. And indeed, he waited for that moment. And maybe then, or definitely then, said Yehuda to himself, is there a much greater chance that I get a response over here? And really, that, that in itself is an incredible lesson, because this is Yaakov Abinu, who can have more foresight than him. <clears throat> Although we're told that at this point he lost his Nebuah, but he's still, this is a, a brilliant man with incredible foresight. And yet, when other emotions got a hold of him, he didn't use that foresight. And sometimes, when you're not getting through to a person, as painful as it is, as much as you don't want to see it happen, sometimes you tell yourself, you just have to let them go through with whatever they want to. Let them stumble, let them feel their error, and then their attitude will slowly transform. You know, let them make a mistake. And that indeed is the way Yehuda felt. You know, I can't, I'm not going to penetrate right now. He looked at the little band and said, it's not going to work. You're yelling at a wall. He has an incredibly a powerful response and it's emotional. And it's, to him, it was very practical. You won't get through. What's the purpose? Wait until he's softened by life's circumstances. That's often the way that we have to face <clears throat> sometimes getting through to people. In a realistic way, it takes patience. <clears throat> now, of course, that's just surface level practical reasons <clears throat> why he favored the presentation of Yehuda over Yudu Ben. The, um, the Orha Chaim HaKadosh takes us to a deeper level. And he says, if you look at the words, well, Yudu Ben just simply said, take my two children and kill them. Again, it doesn't have to mean kill, but <clears throat> how many sons did Yudu Ben have? Four. Why two? He left a few over in this argument of his, says the Orachayim, because he really didn't want to, you know, at the most extreme scenario, be without children. In other words, hurt my physical life, but my eternal life, ma'olam habad, the mizvah of having children, taking that, I don't want to give that up. Limited. Turn the page and see what the actual terminology in the argument of Yehuda is, was, and that is, if I don't bring him back to you, kol hayamim, endless, eternal, I'm giving up myself, it's on me, and we saw, fast forward, uh, into the end of the parasha, he was willing to give up his own life for Binyamin, when he got into that situation, if I need to give up and tell you I'm a sinner forever, my, my eternal life, my spirituality, so to speak, my olam haba, I'm holding nothing back. Holding nothing back, said Yehuda. 
And indeed, when Yaakov saw that, he saw that this person is a more qualified candidate. I can invest my trust in someone that has purely no condition. Although, you know, ben, huh, my two sons, that's something big. It's a major sacrifice. And yet, there was something that he couldn't let go of. There, there was something conditional about it. There was some strings attached. And when you see that, um, you're less likely to put your life in that person's hands, as opposed to the other person who says, um, there is no length that I won't go to in order to, to, get your, to, to get your back. And that was Yehuda's presentation. And indeed, we see the powerful words of Yehuda. I am the guarantee. My life is the guarantee. I will put my life on the line for you. And Yaakov responded to that. And really, when you want to convince someone, they have to detect the sincerity. And they have to detect that there's nothing else about what you are asking or convincing them of besides the, virtu the virtuous nature of what you want from them. The beauty, the purity of what you're requesting. There's nothing else involved. There's no strings attached. Then you'll get it. Then you'll make the sale. Um, but finally, um, we have to, first of all, look at something very interesting. And what I think the most profound message from all of this, look at the beginning of Pasuk Het. And what is that all about? Who was Yehuda talking to? Go five Pesukim earlier. Vayomer elav Yehuda. Lemor, Yehuda spoke to his father. Three Pesukim later, Pesuk Vav, Vayomer Yisrael. Yisrael spoke to Yehuda. Vayomer, Vayomer, Vayomer. Vayomer Yehuda and Pesuk Het of Yisrael Abiv, Yisrael his father. We have to be told right here, right now, that it's his father. They're talking face to face, back and forth, back, Vayomer, Vayomer, right? Fine, say the name. You could have skipped the name. You could have just said Vayomer, because you know whose turn is next, right? But fine. The previous two Pesukim, Gimal and Vav, said the name, Yisrael and Yehuda. Um, so he said his name. But you have to tell me, Il Yisrael, who we're speaking to? We know who we're speaking to. And you have to tell me, Abi, that it's his father? All superfluous. Says the Aimek Davar, this was a transformative moment in this conversation. Because the Torah is bringing out to us, and his language is, here he spoke belev nachon with absolute confidence. She'en lo pahad mikol ofane pahadim. There was no fear when these words came out of his mouth that I am the guarantor. My life is the security for this boy. Nihyev lo namud. He exuded the most confidence possible. And you, Yaakov was dumbfounded. He was struck with this person that stood before him in absolute unlimited confidence. Now, confidence doesn't mean that you're, that you're, you're starry-eyed and that you're unrealistic. To be sure, in the next pasuk, he says, well, you know, I'm guaranteeing, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't come back, I'm a sinner. He left room for that possibility. But in his presentation, Yehuda saw nothing but success. He told his father, Nakuma Nelecha, Yalla, let's get going. We're not going to die. We're going to live. Was he a Navi? Was he predicting? Actually, Raji says, at that moment, he has some Ruach HaKodesh. But the truth is, he can't guarantee. Those words were words of guarantee. Those words were words of focus. Right now in this mission, not guaranteeing you anything. Yeah, I could be a sinner. But listen, I'm telling you something. We're succeeding. There was nothing in his trajectory besides success. And that's the way a leader has to think. That's the way a person who is achieving has to approach issues and predicaments in life. Lehav Deal, famously, Babe Ruth, with a great home run hitter who had the home run record for decades and decades in baseball history. Ironically, for many decades, he also had the record for most strikeouts in a year and, and in a career. And once he was interviewed uh, by one of the sports writers, and he said, Mr. Ruth, how do you feel? What goes through your mind when you strike out? Do you strike out all the time? And to that he answered, I think of hitting home runs. I don't think of the failure. 
The reason that I succeed with the home run to begin with is that even when I'm failing, I'm thinking of success. There's nothing before me than success. And that is embedded in the psyche of a leader. There's no point in thinking about also, do I make uh, backup plans? Do I have contingencies? Of course I do. I'm realistic. But my mind, in my mind, I only believe that what I will achieve, if I'm doing it, because this who is behind me, it's the right thing to do. I only know success. To that, Yaakov was like, this guy is going to achieve. I'll put my life in this guy's hands. And that indeed is what we tell warriors, soldiers, the halakha, look up the Rambam. When you fight, it's asur to think of anything. The Torah warns us in Parashat Shofetim, no fear. No fear. There's isurim in the Torah of fearing. Just go straight on your path of success. HaKadosh Baruch is behind you and think of nothing else. Hanukkah, the miracles, the war, the, the success was beyond reality. It was so unrealistic. And yet they achieved it because they believed that they could achieve it. That's the way we succeed. That's the way great leaders think. That's what Yaakov Abinu saw in Yehuda. And indeed, we see as the parasha concludes, when indeed they went back and forth and everything was okay, but then they hid the cup and the and the uh, and they chased after him in the bag of Benjamin and they found them. It says at the end of the parasha in Perek Memdalet, when this tragic thing occurred to them, they ripped their clothing, and Pasuk Yud Dalet says, and they had to return, as if he was now the default leader. They voted with their feet. Yehuda and his brothers came back. Because this person exuded the confidence and the drive that made everyone want to follow him. And of course, as if there's no one else in the group, next week's parasha starts with Vayigash Elav Yehuda. And of course, eventually, at the end of the parasha, when, it, when every, everything uh, ended happily ever after, Vayishlach Lefanav Yehuda Goshna, Yaakov, as the clearer of the path, sent Yehuda in front. And of course, from Yehuda came David HaMelech and this dynasty, which eventually will lead to Melech HaMashiach And so we see the makings of leadership, the mindset of a leader, the psyche and the approach of a leader. And of course, that's what Yaakov saw clear in his son Yehuda. And that's why he heeded his call and no one else's. Baruch Shabbat Shalom. Baruch Amen v'amen.